I'm not exactly sure where to begin with this one. I've been reading a lot of stories on this forum, and they've been a great help. But now, I think it's time to share my own story. D-Day was almost a year ago. My soon-to-be ex-wife, let's call her Jenny. Jenny and I go way back to high school. She's the younger sister of one of my friends. We used to flirt a bit, but nothing serious happened because I was four years older than her. After high school, I got an athletic scholarship and went off to college to play football. Sadly, my career was cut short due to an injury. When I got injured and was confined to bed for three months at my parents' house, Jenny, who was still in high school, would come over after school to spend time with me. I can honestly say that her presence played a big part in my speedy recovery. She'd visit after school and sometimes stay till late in the evening. My parents got used to her being around, and it wasn't long before we made our relationship official. We'd lie in bed, dreaming up our future together, talking about getting married one day and what I'd do once I recovered. I knew I couldn't go back to college because my scholarship was gone due to my injury. Back then, my dream was to open a gym and run it together with her. I wasn't too bummed about my injury and the end of my athletic career. I believe everything happens for a reason. We spent a lot of time dreaming about our future, because you have to dream before your dreams can come true. She promised to join me in this venture, even if it meant dropping out of college to help me run the business. Once I recovered from my injuries, I got a job at 24-Hour Fitness. I became a personal trainer and started building a list of loyal clients, even hosting classes on meetup groups. I even branched out and became a yoga instructor, hosting free yoga sessions in public parks for more exposure. I was pretty active on social media and managed to build a decent following. I rented studios to hold classes for paying clients and even collaborated with other trainers to run classes for them. But I was itching to have my own space. Two years down the line, I managed to open a 2,500-square-foot gym. I took out a loan to buy equipment, and since I wasn't making enough to hire additional employees, Jenny stepped in. She was my girlfriend at the time, and seeing that I needed support, she quit school to help me run the business, just like she'd promised years earlier. We were already paying rent for the gym, so to save on costs, we decided to live there too. It was a small gym, but we made it work. Our membership base grew slowly but surely, month by month, thanks to our hard work and excellent customer service. We just about managed to keep the lights on. It was definitely a challenge, especially with all the competition from other big franchise gyms. About a year later, the business started to stabilize. We managed to pay off our equipment loans, and finally, we could afford to rent an apartment so we wouldn't have to live in the gym anymore. The business wasn't raking in the big bucks like I'd hoped, but we were making ends meet. I quickly figured out that the only way to really grow was to open another gym, which would demand even more of my time. But we were fueled by grit and determination to make our mark in this industry. Our dream was very much alive, and it was easier to put in the hard yards because we could see the fruits of our labor, no matter how slow they were in coming. If it wasn't for Jenny, I'm not sure the business would have made it. I mean, who else would work for three years without a paycheck? The first major hiccup in our relationship was sparked by jealousy. A rumor started circulating that a client and I were more than just trainer and trainee. Now, I had mostly female clients, and the majority of my group classes were women. In fact, about 95% of my clients were women. It's not that I intentionally sought them out, it's just that most guys are too proud to get a fitness trainer, thinking they can handle it on their own. Women, on the other hand, are more open to it and are willing to shell out good money for it. Since these women looked up to me, they started vying for my attention, which led to some jealousy among them. In my case, one woman in my workout group got envious, thinking I was giving more attention to another woman which I wasn't. So, she started dropping hints to the other women that we had something going on. I guess she was trying to make the other women jealous or to keep them at bay, even though they all knew I was taken. You know how these things can spiral when women start gossiping. Well, Jenny caught wind of it, and boy was I in hot water. I swore to her that nothing happened. After a lot of convincing, Jenny said she believed me. But even though she said she trusted me, I could tell she had a sliver of doubt. She started popping in during my classes and training sessions and would get jealous when I trained attractive women. This was something she never used to do. That's when things started to go south in our relationship. I felt awful about this. I wanted to do whatever I could to fix things. 
To me, Jenny was more than a girlfriend. She was the woman who nursed me back to health, worked on our business without pay, and was my ride-or-die chick for life. It hurt me that she was beginning to question my commitment to her. That's when I decided to propose. And it wasn't just a proposal. I also bought her a new car, which she badly needed at the time since we were sharing one. We even took a week-long vacation on a cruise ship. Seeing her so happy was absolutely delightful. When we returned from our vacation, she was recharged. The spark that she had at the start of our relationship was back. It felt good to know exactly what she needed, to be able to push the right buttons in our relationship without her even having to say anything. Fast forward five years after opening the gym, we were finally making enough profit to hire staff. For the first time, Jenny wasn't working 16-hour shifts. We even opened another gym, larger than our first one. We reached a point in our lives where we started planning to start a family within a year. Then disaster struck. Jenny was doing a deadlift and suffered a freak back injury. I referred her to my sports doctor, the same one who helped me recover from my injury back in my college days. I still see him for checkups every two months. Her injury meant she had to take several weeks off work. She was going for therapy three times a week and couldn't stand for extended periods. Around this time, we decided to tie the knot. After we got married, she was still recovering from her back injury, so she was home all the time, while I was managing the two gyms with my team. It was a lot of stress, but I'm a hard worker, and I didn't complain because I could see the value in all my hard work. The only issue was that my wife started to feel like we weren't spending enough time together. And I agreed with her because I was only home for about eight hours a day, most of which I spent eating and sleeping. It was different from when we used to spend the whole day together at the gym. Then she started making new friends outside our usual social circle, two women in particular. I didn't know much about them, but they seemed to make her happy and kept her busy. She stopped nagging me about coming home early and spending more time with her, which took some pressure off me and allowed me to focus on our business and making sure she was well taken care of. She started shopping a lot, wearing designer clothes, and asking me for more money. I think her new friends influenced her a lot. I wasn't too bothered because the amounts she was asking for were reasonable, and even if they weren't, I was willing to give it to her because of all the sacrifices she'd made for me. One day, she told me she was going on a cruise trip with her friends. It was a destination we'd planned to visit together, and I was bummed that we weren't going together. I was still supportive and asked her if she needed any money for the trip, but she said her friends were covering it. With Jenny away, I was able to put in more hours at work. We even chatted on the phone during her trip, and everything seemed normal. I could hear her friends in the background, so I had no reason to suspect she was with another man. When she returned from the trip, she became distant and less affectionate. We both have high libidos and used to be intimate multiple times a week, but that stopped completely. Whenever I initiated, she acted as if I was pressuring her. I tried to spice things up by adding more foreplay, which worked for a while, but then things went back to being stale. I would ask her how her therapy was going, and she would always respond positively. We used to go to her doctor's appointments together, but she suddenly stopped inviting me. Whenever I suggested accompanying her, she always had one excuse or another. About three months after her cruise trip, she dropped a bombshell on me. She was pregnant. I was taken aback because I thought she was on birth control, and we hadn't planned for this. She assured me she'd been taking her pill, but it had failed. I knew that birth control was about 91% effective, meaning that around 9 out of 100 women on the pill could get pregnant in a year. I figured she was one of the unlucky ones. I embraced the news and was excited about becoming a dad. However, two months into her pregnancy, I started noticing some red flags. She became distant and was constantly texting. Sometimes, when I'd call to check on her, she wouldn't pick up. I confronted her about this, but she'd get defensive and pick fights. I chalked it up to hormonal changes due to her pregnancy, so I tried to avoid arguments and just go with the flow. Then, one night when I got home, she dropped another bombshell. She told me our relationship wasn't working out, that we felt more like roommates than a married couple. I was stunned. She said she wanted a divorce. It felt like a slap in the face, and my ears were ringing. I begged her, promising to do whatever it took to keep us together. It didn't make any sense to me. I asked her how she could break up with me when she was carrying my child, 
but she remained silent. I asked her if there was someone else, and she denied it. That night, I couldn't sleep. I retreated to my office to think things through and get my finances in order. Both our names were on the gyms, and I feared I might lose them both in a divorce. It made no sense to me why she'd want to tear down everything we'd worked so hard to build together. I suspected there was more to the story, so out of curiosity, I started checking her iCloud. I noticed she was texting someone named Doc, a lot more than she was texting me. I opened the text thread, and it was as clear as day. She'd been having an affair with the doctor I'd recommended. They'd gone on the cruise together, along with her friends, and the doctor had paid for the trip for her and her friends. I rushed home and confronted her right away. She confessed to having an affair with the doctor for the past six months. She put on a show of tears, but I could see through her act. It was clear she'd checked out of our marriage a long time ago, and I was just left in the dark. When I asked if that was why she wanted a divorce, she said yes. It shattered me. I couldn't believe our relationship had deteriorated to this point. The doctor she was having an affair with was a married man with kids. To give you some perspective, I'm 28 years old, and she's 24. The doctor is 43 years old, nearly twice her age. What hurt me even more was when I asked her who the father of the baby was. She said it was the doctor's. I was crushed inside, but I managed to stay calm. The regular exercise had taught me how to remain composed in difficult situations, and it was a skill that came in handy now. I asked her how foolish she thought she was to get pregnant by a married man while she herself was married. She told me the doctor was planning to divorce his wife as soon as she told me she was leaving me. I pointed out that she hadn't told me, I had to find out for myself and confront her. She confessed that she'd been trying to tell me for the past two months, but just couldn't muster the courage. She said she felt relieved that I'd found out, she claimed to understand the betrayal and how I must be feeling, and promised to give me an amicable divorce. She didn't want any part of the gym business we'd built together. She just wanted me not to fight them during the divorce or tarnish the doctor's reputation. In return, she'd grant me a clean exit, no questions asked. She and the doctor wanted to get married as soon as possible. It seemed like she'd rehearsed what she was going to say to me with a lawyer hired by the doctor, and she'd been coached on what to say. It hurt to see how easily it all came to her. It was like she was a different person. To me, she was more than just my business partner, she was the love of my life. To reduce our relationship to a business transaction showed that she'd checked out of our marriage a long time ago. Now I was left to pick up the pieces and move on. It's hard to fight for someone who's already given up on you for a richer man. The doctor might have more cash than me, but he'd never truly respect her because he was already wealthy before marrying her. I guess she was fed up with the struggle and bolted at the first chance she got. If she'd been smart, she would have realized that our business was on the brink of a major breakthrough. All our years of hard work were about to pay off. I couldn't wrap my head around why she'd hustle and grind with me for so long, only to bail when we were nearly at the peak. I guess her love for me must have faded. I also found out that the doctor was divorcing his wife too, and he was giving her everything she asked for in the divorce to speed things up. I guess being the bigger breadwinner, he'd be able to recoup everything in a few years. The very next day, my wife had a process server deliver the divorce papers to me at work. It was embarrassing and totally unnecessary. I tried to call her to express my displeasure, but she'd already blocked my number, which was a first. When I got home, she'd cleared out all her stuff. I was crushed. For the first time in my life, I felt alone, betrayed, and depressed. But I didn't let myself stay down for long. I've faced tough challenges all my life. With determination and confidence, I signed the divorce papers, giving her the freedom to marry the doctor. I didn't try to confront the doctor or badmouth him because that was part of the agreement. He took my wife, and in return, I kept my mouth shut. If I broke that agreement, I'd lose the business I'd worked so hard to build. It was a tough spot to negotiate from, but what choice did I have? Jenny, the woman I'd weathered so many storms with, didn't want me anymore. Fighting for her, or going to war for her, would be like crying over spilt milk. Just two days after I signed the divorce papers, my ex-wife announced our split on Facebook, posting some nonsense about how we'd grown apart and how I'd been a great partner. Reading it made me feel sick, but I knew I had to move on. I threw myself into my work and focused on growing my business. 
I heard that the doctor had rented a swanky apartment for them to live in, leaving his betrayed wife with their house. I guess he could easily afford another one. A couple of months later, I was scrolling through Facebook and came across a picture of them. The doctor was flaunting Jenny, his new trophy wife, cradling her pregnant belly, flashing her diamond engagement ring. It made my skin crawl. They were everywhere. It felt like every time I opened social media, I'd see a post of them. I couldn't just avoid social media because it was integral to my business. Even though we'd agreed on all the paperwork and asset separation, we were technically still married. It would take six months for the divorce to be finalized and for the judge to sign the decree. But then, four months after I'd signed the divorce papers, I saw some shocking news on Facebook. Jenny and the doctor had been at a 4th of July party on the lake, on his boat. There was a collision with another boat, and the doctor passed away on the spot. Jenny had some minor injuries, and several other people were hurt, but the doctor and one other person didn't make it. I couldn't help but feel a pang of sympathy. If the doctor had stayed with his wife instead of chasing after mine, maybe he wouldn't have been on that boat. At the time of the accident, Jenny was about six months pregnant. She wasn't seriously hurt, just some minor scrapes and bruises. I would have called her to offer my condolences, but she'd already blocked my number. Then, about three weeks later, I got a summons to court. Apparently Jenny was trying to get her lawyer to toss out the divorce agreement we'd already signed. We ended up in court, and after the judge reviewed our case, he told her that the agreement was already signed, and she couldn't change it just because her circumstances had changed. Obviously, she never married the doctor, so she wasn't entitled to any of his money. The judge told her there was no way he'd consider dismissing the agreement and that the world doesn't revolve around her wishes. Jenny and the doctor had wanted a quick divorce, hoping to start a great life together. But fate had other plans. The judge pointed out that her plan to swap husbands didn't work out, and now she was trying to dump everything back on me after betraying my trust. She argued that she was entitled to half of my business because we built it together, and that she dropped out of college for my business. She claimed she had no way of making ends meet because she had no marketable skills and a baby on the way. The judge told her to get her resume together and find childcare or a family member to help her out. All she kept saying was that it was unfair, and she wouldn't even look at me in court. I told her that everything that had happened was her decision, and she'd essentially hung herself with her own actions. I was just a bystander in all this. After she lost the case and the judge granted our divorce as per the original agreement, she unblocked my number and started trying to negotiate with me. It was unbelievable how she thought she could manipulate me now that I was wise to her games. It's still heartbreaking to this day, because she was my first true love. Sadly, things got so bad for her that she ended up giving up the child for adoption and now works as a server at a restaurant. I found this out because I went to the restaurant where Jenny was working with my new girlfriend a few months after our divorce was finalized. I planned it so she would be working that day and serve me and my girlfriend. When she came to our table and saw us, she broke down and started crying. I had intended it to be a sort of revenge, a way to get some satisfaction because I was still hurt by her betrayal. But it backfired on me because I started crying too, and I had to walk out of the restaurant. That was the last time I saw her. I've sworn never to marry again. As a personal trainer who now owns three gyms and is making good money, finding women is easy. So I just have to make sure I protect my assets and never get married again unless there's an ironclad prenup in place. Story 2. So, my soon-to-be wife is a bartender, and that's actually how we first crossed paths. She noticed I was a newbie in her bar, and we got to chatting. Before long, I found myself becoming a regular, mainly because I was keen to see her more often. One day, I plucked up the courage to ask for her number, and that's how our dating journey kicked off. In the early days, I'd observe how her regulars would leave her hefty tips, and she'd return the favor by prioritizing them, the next time they dropped by. Watching her mingle with her preferred patrons stirred up a bit of the green-eyed monster in me. Now, don't get me wrong, she wasn't crossing any lines or getting overly touchy-feely or anything, but sitting there, watching her chat up one guy after another, well, it was a bit hard to swallow. So I made the call to stop popping by her workplace. When she quizzed me about my sudden absence, I was up front with her. 
I told her it was kind of tough for me to see her constantly interacting with a parade of guys. She assured me that it was just part of her job, a way to pay the bills, and there was nothing romantic or sexual about it. She didn't have feelings for any of them. I chose to trust her, and we moved past it. After dating for seven months, we decided to take the plunge and get engaged. Soon after, we started talking about starting a family. She was more eager for kids than I was, mainly because all her friends already had children and she'd always dreamt of having a big family. But it wasn't as easy as we'd hoped. We suffered two miscarriages in quick succession, which was a crushing blow for both of us, especially since she had her heart set on becoming a mom. We spent a fortune on treatments for her condition, but it just didn't seem possible, until, suddenly, just when we decided to let go of that dream, she started feeling unwell. A trip to the doctor brought us the unexpected news. She was already four months pregnant. We were both overwhelmed with joy and happiness, but because we hadn't known about the pregnancy, she had spent those four months lifting heavy things, drinking on the job, and smoking. Tragically, these factors led to our baby passing away a few days after birth. She was crushed, blaming herself over and over again. She'd wake up screaming in her sleep, repeating that she'd killed our baby. I won't lie. Those few months were some of the hardest in my life, but there was a silver lining. We knew now that it was possible for her to get pregnant. We clung to that glimmer of hope. It was the lifeline we needed. Because of that, she was able to look forward and start to move on. She made the choice to leave her job, and I was all for it. I was making enough to support us both, so she didn't need to work. She started therapy and began a daily exercise routine. I could see her spirits lifting with each passing day, and our relationship was improving. After a surgery and some other medical procedures, we were prepared. I was working extra hours because the medical bills were stacking up, even with her insurance. But it was all worth it because it finally happened. We did everything by the book this time around. Regular medical checkups, taking vitamins, no smoking or alcohol, regular exercise, healthy eating. We ticked all the boxes but around the six-month mark, it happened again. For no clear reason, we lost our baby. This time, it was even more devastating because there was no one to point fingers at. Nothing was wrong, it just happened. In less than two days, our baby was gone. This time, the grief hit us even harder. With no one to blame, my fiancé started spiraling into paranoia. She blamed the doctor, the nurses, herself, the medication, and inevitably, she blamed me too. Again, the following months were a nightmare. My body adapted to this new reality by developing a light sleep pattern. Whenever I'd hear her scream or have nightmares, I'd instantly wake up, hold her close, reassure her that everything was going to be okay. And once she calmed down, I'd fall back asleep instantly. I was surviving on just a few hours of sleep each night. And there were times when I'd stay awake when her nightmares got worse. Throughout this ordeal, I had people reaching out to me, asking about her well-being, or if we needed anything. They were too scared to approach her directly. All this while, I've been bottling up my own pain, unable to share with her how utterly shattered I am. She always tells me how much she's leaned on me and feels guilty about it. But I've noticed that whenever I show any signs of faltering, her condition worsens, so I've learned to keep my feelings locked away. I tried to share once but it didn't go well. She had a minor mental breakdown, and I couldn't continue. She's incredibly strong to endure this whole process, but she crumbles easily when I show any signs of weakness. She needs my strength to keep going, and any display of vulnerability on my part makes her feel guilty. She's transformed into a completely different person from the woman I fell in love with, and understandably so. She's developed complexes, mood swings, and other coping mechanisms, but we've kept pushing forward. One day, she mentioned she was thinking of returning to her job because we were struggling to keep up with all the medical bills. I felt a pang of sadness because I knew this was a sign that we were losing hope of having a child, something she'd always dreamed of. But I also knew that the medical bills were becoming a mountain too high for me to climb. I thought maybe if she started working again, it might help bring back the woman I fell in love with. However, two weeks after she resumed her job, she seemed even more distant. I'd get home from work at 5 p.m. and she'd be working until 3 a.m., so we barely saw each other except on weekends when I wasn't working. I wanted to shake things up a bit, 
maybe recreate the times I used to visit her at work to rekindle our connection. So, one Friday night, I decided to surprise her at her workplace. I showed up around 10 p.m., unannounced. When I walked in, I didn't see her behind the bar. There were two other female bartenders working, but she wasn't among them. Thinking she might be in the back or had stepped out to the restroom, I decided to wait. After about 20 minutes, one of the bartenders recognized me. She informed me that my fiancé had left about 30 minutes ago and I'd just missed her. I asked why my fiancé had left early, mentioning that I'd come to surprise her. The bartender told me that since returning to work, my fiancé had been leaving at 10 p.m. This was news to me, she'd never mentioned it. I played it cool, pretending I already knew, as the bartender was giving me a strange look. I left the bar, feeling utterly confused. Ever since she'd returned to bartending, my fiancé had always come home around 3 a.m. We share our locations with each other on our iPhones, and her location showed she was just a few steps away in the parking lot. The parking lot was jam-packed that day, but her phone's location was showing up in a more isolated, tree-filled area further out where there were fewer cars. Initially, I thought maybe that's where she'd parked, but then why would she park so far from the bar? As I headed towards the location her phone was pinpointing, I saw her car, parked closer to the bar, right in her usual spot. I checked around her car to make sure it was indeed hers, and to see if anything was off. Everything seemed normal, but I was left scratching my head as to why her phone was showing she was about 50 yards away from her car, in the tree-filled area. There were just three or four cars parked in that area, and as I got closer, I noticed someone was in the driver's seat of one of the cars. The rest of the car seemed empty. I wasn't sure what to expect as I approached the driver's side. What I saw next, I was totally unprepared for. My fiancé was performing BJ on this guy in his car. I froze for a few seconds in shock before he noticed me, and she quickly lifted her head to cover him up. She saw me and instantly covered her face. I was standing there freaking out. I recognized the man. He used to be one of her regular customers, the one who always tipped her generously. My mind raced back to all those customers who were tipping her big and how she used to assure me it meant nothing. So my discomfort about the attention she was giving her favorite customers about eight months ago was justified. The guy instantly sped off, leaving me standing there in a daze. Suddenly, the car halted and my fiancé jumped out, starting to run back towards me as the car sped off again. She rushed up to me pleading that she was sorry that this was the first time something like this had happened. She confessed she'd been feeling down and depressed, even contemplating self-harm, and was doing anything she could to lift her spirits. She pleaded with me to go home together, saying she just wanted to hold me and didn't want to lose me. I told her I needed some space to process what I'd just seen. I started walking briskly towards my car with her trailing behind me, apologizing over and over. She caught up to me and tried to grab my hands, but I pushed her away firmly. Once we got home, she confessed everything because I was about to go through her phone and she knew that coming clean was the only chance for any sort of reconciliation. And you know what? Turns out there were four more customers she'd been sleeping with during her pregnancy. She only confessed because she knew I would have discovered it if I'd checked her phone. So while we were trying to start a family, she was sleeping with other men behind my back. She claimed she was using protection, but I don't buy it. When I caught her in the car with one of her customers, there was no protection involved. I feel like our entire relationship has been a sham. In a twisted way, the miscarriages might have been a blessing in disguise. If she'd gotten pregnant, we would have probably gotten married, and I would have been none the wiser about her affairs with five other guys. And who knows, the child might not even have been mine. That night, I told her I didn't think we could continue the relationship. She threatened to harm herself if I left her. But I know now that she's just using that to manipulate me and keep me in this relationship. I've learned my lesson, though. I've already told my best friend about everything, and I'll be moving in with him until I can find a more permanent living situation. At first, I kept it from my family because I was too embarrassed to tell them. I knew they'd be disappointed since they were so fond of her. Two weeks after D-Day, I finally moved out of the apartment. She was still trying to get me to help with her medical bills. I told her I couldn't support her in that way, and I wasn't legally obligated to since we weren't married. I suggested she ask all the guys she cheated on me with to chip in and help with her bills. 
I wanted to keep our breakup low-key. But when she started spreading rumors that I was the one who cheated, trying to tarnish my reputation, I decided to tell my family the real story. I also told our mutual friends that she was the one who cheated on me with multiple men.